close to getting to the 11 o'clock hour. Just want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone. Brother Harry was, <clears throat> as we were praying just a few moments ago, thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this day. And this is one of the blessings of this day, of being together. And so I want to uh, welcome you, and I want to tell you how wonderful it is to welcome you, and not just in a, a greeting that we've been doing the last few weeks uh, as we've been live streaming, but to actually see people in the congregation. And uh, it, it's wonderful. And so thank you for being here this morning. And also, I would say to welcome those who are watching us uh, uh, on social media, through, face, through our church's Facebook page, and also our YouTube page, and knowing that many who are watching us this morning uh, would desire to be here uh, if they could. And uh, so we understand with all of the, the things surrounding this virus and how it attacks those especially who are vulnerable uh, because of underlying health issues that uh, we understand your, uh, your thoughts of uh, wanting to be here, but uh, may, it's not safe. So we recognize that, but just welcome you this morning and trust that we will all pray together for the Lord's blessings to be with us this day as we come to worship him. And of course, uh, we will have uh, on our uh, PowerPoint uh, the lyrics to the songs that we'll be singing and um, and uh, so we'll, Brother Wade will be leading us this morning uh, with the playing of the, of, uh, of the guitar. And so we want to lift our voices as best we can to sing praises to the Lord. So many of you are wearing masks, and that's fine. And, uh, and we, we, we did send out a message about recommending that you do so, but not mandating that you do so. So however you feel, and we trust with the social distancing that we're observing here that we are doing this safely and so but uh, thank you again for uh, being here this morning just a, a one other announcement to make and uh, we are planning to resume our evening worship services next Sunday and so uh, we will look forward to our meeting together for that uh, decisions about Bible study will be made in the next few weeks and, uh, of course, uh, we uh, want to be safe when we do so. So, uh, so let's uh, be mindful of all of these things and just rejoice in this opportunity that we have to be together. I think on the message that I sent out on Friday, on our phone tree message, um, we need this, don't we? We need to be here in the house of the Lord. And, um, and uh, so may God bless us uh, uh, this day. Uh, we're going to have a prelude now, and uh, it is from Fernando Ortega, and uh, so let's, uh, as the prelude is being played, let's uh, be in much prayer for the Lord's blessings to be upon us and for his presence to fill this place.
Would you stand with me now as I read our scriptural call to worship? The passage I want to read this morning is found in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 53, one of the great chapters in the Bible. I'll read all of that chapter, Isaiah chapter 53, beginning with verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's join together for prayer now. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for this Lord's day and for this time that we have that we are able to gather together in this sanctuary. We are thankful for this high and holy privilege. And we pray now as we come to this place of worship, we ask that thou wilt be with us, the person of thy Holy Spirit, that he will come and guide us and direct us and bless us that our minds might be fixed upon thee and that we make Uh, focus our hearts upon the things of God. We pray blessings upon the preaching of the word. We ask that thou wilt bless Brother Dean as he stands and preaches the word, give him liberty, freedom of speech, of understanding. Bless all of us to hear thy word with spiritual understanding. And then bless us to take it away from this place and keep it in our hearts. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Psalm 
Bible said it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto his name.
and sing a song that is uh, appropriate for the times in which we live. And the verses are a series of questions. And I ask you to personalize those questions. And then the chorus, we affirm our faith. And I would ask you to do that also as I sing this song, As You Are Glorified. Shall I take from your hand your blessing, yet not welcome any pain? Shall I thank you in days of sunshine, yet crumble in days of rain? Shall I love you? Let us all join together now in prayer. Almighty God and our eternal Heavenly Father, again we thank Thee for this opportunity of being in Thy house this morning. 
We're thankful for all of those who are present. We pray, Lord, blessings upon those who are physically unable to be here. We know that there are some of our congregation like that, and with the circumstances that we face in these days, it's best for them not to come. We pray blessings upon all of them. We're just thankful that we can come this morning and join together in worship thank thee for all of those who are present here this morning. And we pray that thou wilt bind us together in the bonds of love and fellowship, and that thy Holy Spirit would come and dwell in our midst. We ask special blessing upon all of the service, especially do we pray for the preaching of the word. We know that thou hast ordained great things through the preaching of thy word. And we pray that thou wilt bless Brother Dean as he comes to stand before this pulpit and proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. May he do so with great power in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for thy people everywhere this morning. We know that because of the difficulties brought about by this virus that has swept over our land, it's, it's difficult to carry on the normal times of worship. And we're thankful that we have this opportunity. We understand that there are those in our country who do not have this privilege. Some are being kept away by law. We pray for them, O oh Lord. We ask your blessings upon them. We ask for blessings upon those who have special needs in our congregation and in our families. We are especially mindful of those who have lost loved ones. We pray that I will Enclose them in thy great arms of peace and love and give them consolation. We pray for those who are uh, sick and shut in. Some of our people are in that way. We pray especially for them. So we ask now, Lord, that thou wilt come in the person of thy Holy Spirit Help us to fix our minds upon thee and bless us to rejoice in God our Savior and help us, O oh Lord, to be built up in our faith and in our love for thee, in our devotion to thee, and give us grace to serve thee in a more acceptable way in the days to come. Draw us close to thee now, dear Father, Keep us by thy grace and forgive us of our sins. For we ask all of these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and for his sake we pray. Amen. So song in preparation for the preaching of God's word, we're going to sing a verse and a chorus of ancient words. In the Bible it says the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we might have hope. These are ancient words. This book that we read and we preach from, but they are ever timely and they're ever true. <laughs>
God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us hope in this world. would ask that you get your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews and to chapter number 4. Hebrews chapter 4, I want to read to you verses 14 through 16, and this morning I would like for our emphasis to be uh, on verse 16 and on this rather wonderful privilege I'll probably speak a number of times of, a, of this being a blessed privilege of our ability to come into the very presence of God, to come to the very throne of God. Uh, a throne that is, as you will see, is described as a throne of grace. And so I've titled the message this morning, Coming Boldly Unto God's Throne. So let's look now into the Word of God, again, Hebrews chapter 4, and beginning at verse 14, and know, brothers and sisters, that this is the ancient Word. It is the Word of God. The Word of God reads, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So reads the word of God, and may God bless now the reading of his word. And would you join me now for another moment of prayer? O oh God, our Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you now as we have read your word and, Lord, now desire to see into it and to, to have it, Lord, to change our lives as we sung a few moments ago. Lord, you have chosen to have your word go forth. And the promise of your word is that it shall not return unto you void, but it, that it shall accomplish that which you please, that which you have purposed. Father, that is the very foundation of the hope I have right now. That, Father, you will bless the preaching of your word, that you will cause it to Nourish the souls of these that are here this morning and those that are listening, Lord, right now through social media. 
thankful to know that, Lord, your word is not bound. It's not chained. And so now bless the preaching of your word. Bless, Lord, your servant. I need you right now. I need the, we need the ministry of the Spirit, as has been prayed, to come and to make application of this word now to our hearts and our minds. Be glorified, O oh God, in what is said. And bless it now for the advancement of your kingdom here in this community of Stilson and wherever, Lord, it goes forth. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the living word. Thank you for the word who was made flesh who came and dwelt among such a sinful people. Thank you, Father, for your love. Bless us now, we humbly ask, in Jesus' name, and amen. An underlying theme that is found here in this epistle to the Hebrews, is that of the superiority or the supremacy of the New Testament over that of the Old Testament. And this is a needful theme because of this view that was gaining traction among the recipients of, these letter, of this letter, who are Jewish converts to Christianity. What was happening was this desire or this temptation to return to the old ways of worship, to return to the traditions of Judaism. And perhaps this looking backwards, this return, this desire to, or just the consideration of returning to the traditions of uh, under the Old Testament dispensation, and namely what we're talking about is the observance of the ceremonial law, was perhaps due to pressure of family members. Perhaps it was even pressure being put upon them in the way of, uh, of persecution, as this is a time of the persecution of the church. And no doubt it was due to the fact that there were false teachers who were coming in to the assemblies of believers there, the churches. As evidenced in, in several of Paul's letters. Perhaps that's was what was happening. And here the writer to the Hebrews, and we are not sure who the writer is, it's not said there, but many think it's the Apostle Paul. But whoever the human writer is, we know ultimately that God is the divine author, and the message is a divine message. And the message is basically this, why? Why go back? Why go back to that which was insufficient for your salvation? Why go back to that which were only types and shadows of the good things to come? Why go back to those things that were but representations of what God had planned in the way of the redemption of His people? Why go back to that which was inferior, to that which has now become obsolete. When you have in your possession right now that which is superior. You have, as we might say, you have the real thing. Why go back to the prophets? Why let them be your mediator between you and God when you have the very Son of God as your mediator? You see, this argument for the superior nature of the New Testament over the Old begins really in the very first verse of this epistle. In the 
Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, God, who at sundry times and in divers' manner spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, as I am speaking of the superiority or the supremacy of the new over the old, please hear me closely, brothers and sisters. In no way am I diminishing the importance of the Old Testament. And never, never would I support the notion, as some have suggested, that we should, and I'll use their words, unhinge the Old Testament from the New Testament. For the Old Testament is the Word of God, as Peter himself wrote in First Peter, and rather Second Peter, chapter one and verse twenty-one, where he writes, "For the prophecy came not in old time uh, by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost." You see, the Old Testament is pointing the way to everlasting life by pointing to the one who would come to give everlasting life. The Old Testament, therefore, is important in the progressive revelation of God's plan of salvation. And specifically now with respect to the law, the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, that law that was given to him. That law, as Paul then said uh, in, to the Galatian church, which the law would be our schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. We have a teacher that shows us that we can't, of our own selves, do works of righteousness. To inherit eternal life. We have a teacher that says, no, you need someone else. You need Christ. And so the law was meant to show us our need for this one to come who would then be able to reconcile us to God. The law, you see, could never reconcile us to God. It told us we are sinners. The law tells us that we should expect judgment. The law tells us that we should expect to receive the wrath of God. No, the new is better than the old. And this statement of the New Covenant being better than the Old Covenant or the New Testament being better than the Old Testament is seen in a number of places here in this epistle. But in chapter 8, verse 13, it says this, In speaking of a new covenant, He makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now, I've, I've taken this time to introduce this thought of the new being better than the old because of what it, we see here in the text that is before us. For in this invitation, and, and I think that's a good way for us to look at our passage, it's an invitation to come. It is an invitation to come into the very presence of God Himself to come boldly, as it says, to the throne of grace. That what we are seeing here <coughs> in this invitation is a manifestation or a display or perhaps a better word is we see a, an illustration, an example of why this life under the New Testament is better than life under the Old. I want, to, I want to give some further thoughts for you to consider about that. I want to suggest to you, first of all, that living under the law, which was characteristic of life under the old covenant, and even 
as I've mentioned to you, that there was this desire and this, these, rather these false teachings being brought in the church that you still must do certain aspects of the law if you are to have life. And so it was a matter of Christ not being sufficient for everlasting life, but you must be, for instance, circumcised. That was continually being taught here in the New Testament church by false teachers. But what I want to suggest to you here is that life under the old covenant, and especially as we think of the old covenant and and the law in particular, what I want to suggest to you is not is no one, no Israelite would at all felt comfortable about coming into the presence of a holy God. Under the Old Testament, Anyone who in their right way of thinking would not have conceived, I don't believe, of the idea of coming before the Lord God Almighty with this fearless confidence. And that's the, that's the understanding of this word boldly that is given in our text here. The Greek word there that is rendered boldly is, is also can be rendered, in, and I believe in the English Standard Version, as confident or confidence. In fact, Thayer uh, speaks of it as, as uh, being uh, uh, coming free uh, in a free way and having a fearless confidence. But you, I don't think you see that kind of attitude in the Old Testament. And, and I, I go to the book of Isaiah and to Isaiah himself when perhaps you remember him being brought into the very throne room, as it were, of God. In that sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, when he saw that the train of his robe filled the temple, when Isaiah saw the seraphim flying uh, around the throne, with his wings covering his face and wings covering his feet and wings even covering his face. When Isaiah heard the cries of that seraphim saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. When, I, when Isaiah felt the very room shake, and saw smoke fill the room. What was he thinking? Well, let me tell you what he was thinking. He said this, woe is me. Woe is me. And, and, and friends, this crying out of woe is me is not a cry of praise and a cry of thanksgiving, but rather, on the other hand, it is a crying out of grief. It is a crying out of lament. It is a crying out of despair. Why? Well, the answer is, he says, for I am lost. He says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And as he is saying that, as he is singing, he's saying, woe is me, I'm lost. The King James says it this way, I am undone. And do you know what the thought of the Greek word behind undone is or lost? It is the thought of perishing. It is the thought of being cut down. Now that, brothers and sisters, friends, I suggest to you is most likely the way most Israelites would have thought about being in the presence of God. Under the old dispensation of the law. We can, we can even go back and look at the account of the people before Mount Sinai. Before, before the Lord gave the, the, the law to them, the Ten Commandments, as we sometimes refer to them. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 12, 
we have these words of warning from God. And you shall let set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go up unto the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. The people there saw the mountain smoke and it shake. Kind of similar to what Isaiah saw in that throne room experience. And they were in great fear. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 17, we read this, Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. You see, I think this thought of being devoured, perhaps even the thought of seeing God somehow and and immediately you're consumed in flames. You see, such was the fear of being in the presence of God under this old dispensation, if you will, this Old Testament. But now you see a change, don't you? Under the New and Better Testament, this Superior Testament, we have this invitation now to come to the throne of God. To come to the throne which is now called a throne of grace. But not just to come to the throne of grace, but to do it how? Boldly. With confidence. What a difference we see here. From the fear of perishing or of being undone, of being devoured by fire from being in the presence of God to now coming freely and with, as Thayer says, fearless confidence. And brothers and sisters, friends, God desires now for us to come. To come into His presence. God desires for us to come to seek Him. What a glorious privilege we have. What a blessed privilege is given to us to approach the very throne of God, which is, as I said, is called here a throne of grace. And for the believer, we come before His throne to receive His mercy and His grace and not to receive what we truly deserve. What a blessing. Now from the text, I I want to point out to you in the remaining moments of the message, first of all, why it is that we have this blessed privilege of coming boldly to the throne of grace. And then secondly, what it means for us right now to be given this blessed privilege of coming to the throne of grace. First, why? Why is it now possible for us to be given this invitation to come boldly into the presence of God and to not come with thoughts of being undone? Well, the answer lies in five words. These five words are found in verse 14. And they are, Jesus, the Son of God. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now notice what we are seeing here now. We are are seeing that a call is being made. A call is being made to these Hebrew believers. These Hebrew Christians. The call is being made to hold fast Hold fast to your profession. You Hebrew Christians, don't don't look behind you. Don't go back to the traditions of Judaism. Because there's a better than Moses that's here. 
There's a better than Aaron, the high priest, who has come. And his name is Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God. And this argument you see to hold fast your profession is based upon certain things about Jesus, that he is the Son of God, (coughs) that he is divine, that he is God incarnate, and that he is their high priest. And that he has passed into the heavens. Well, let's look at that a little little more closely. With regards to the profession here, this is talking, as I understand, about their, their belief, their faith in the message of the gospel that was preached to them. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, that Jesus, as the Son of God and as also the Son of Abraham, did what no other son of Abraham could do, and that he kept the law of Moses perfectly, and that in him doing so, he, by the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary, once and for all, made atonement for the sins of of his people. That the justice of God was satisfied by the death of Jesus That the price to secure the redemption of the elect was paid and was paid in full and that price was paid by His blood. The blood of Christ. And that by one's faith or belief in Jesus as the Son of God, as Savior and Lord, one is now justified before God, having received now the imputed righteousness of Jesus. This is the gospel message believed by these Hebrew Christians. This is the profession for which they are now called upon to hold fast. And friends, this message has not changed. This is the gospel. This is the gospel that we are called upon to hold fast to. This is what allows us, you see, to come boldly to the throne of grace. With regards to Jesus being their high priest, the argument being put forward here is that Jesus is the one who has interceded on their behalf and offered before the Father His own blood as an atoning sacrifice, as the Son of God and as the Son of Abraham. He was sinless coming into the world and He was sinless as He lived in this world And therefore, he is the superior high priest to that of Aaron and of Aaron's sons who were sinners and who died and who were still in the grave. Jesus, as the superior high priest, who we also see now in verse 15, is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, yet, as it says, he was without sin. It is Jesus, you see, who enters through the veil there of the Holy of Holies and offers the blood sacrifice upon the mercy seat, his blood. And that sacrifice was accepted by God forever. The sacrifices of the Aaronic priesthood, of animals, they were done every year. In fact, there were also daily sacrifices done. I don't know if anybody can even put a number on the total number of animals that were sacrificed. They had to do it every year. On the Day of Atonement. And that's when the Aaronic priesthood would come into the, through the veil and offer the blood of an animal upon the mercy seat. But they needed to do that every year. It's not the case anymore. Because of a superior high priest and the fact that Jesus Himself 
is his blood that was sprinkled upon the mercy seat. And the proof of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus is to be seen as Jesus passing into the heavens and not remaining in the grave. He came down from heaven, emptying himself of his glory, as the Apostle Paul uh, writes in in the book of uh, Philippians. Emptying himself of his glory to take on the form of a servant. To become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And now he has passed back into the heavens on the day of his ascension, some 40 days after his death and his resurrection from the grave. Jesus went to be at the right hand of the Father to intercede on behalf of his people. And he's right there right now. Making intercession for you and for me. This is why we can come with confidence before the very throne of God, the throne of grace. Jesus, the Son of God. And so he writes to the Christians, hold fa- these Hebrew Christians, hold fast to their profession. And so he exhorts you and I to do the same today. We must embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. If we are to come boldly to the throne of grace, we must hold fast this profession. We must embrace the finished work of Jesus on the cross and not any of our own works of righteousness, for we have no works of righteousness. And that's the issue here. That's what the Hebrew, these Hebrew Christians were being tempted to do. Now, secondly and quickly, having seen the why, why it is that we have this blessed privilege of coming boldly to the throne of grace, that it's because of Jesus, the Son of God, let's consider now what this means for us right now to act on this invitation to come to the throne of God And from the text, we note two blessings that are offered to us right now. First, it is that we might obtain mercy. And second, that we might find grace to help in the time of need. Look at at our text here. I'll, I'll read verse 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore... You remember that idea of the word therefore. It calls our attention to look at what has gone on just before. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Here the writer of the Hebrews, having expressed the superiority of the ministry of Jesus above that of Moses and Aaron because of his divine nature, I believe calls us now to look upon his human nature. And in his humanity, brothers and sisters, he suffered. He suffers, he suffered just like you and I suffer. Though not in the same way that he did ultimately, but yet he was hungry. Might we become hungry? He needed sleep, just like you and I need sleep. Jesus loved, just like we love. Jesus grieved, just like you and I grieve. And Jesus died just like you and I shall die, should the Lord tarry in his coming again. In all points, it says, he was tempted like as we are, yet he was without sin. Because Jesus left the glory of heaven above and took on the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, we can now come to the throne of God grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in the time of our need. As for our obtaining mercy, as I understand, it's not so much 
talking about the mercy we receive at the moment in time when Jesus said it is finished and an atonement was forever made for our sins, nor does I, do I think it expressly <clears throat> speaks about the moment of our being born again or our receiving the imputed righteousness of Jesus upon receiving Christ as our Savior and Lord. Now, mercy is certainly involved with that. But what I think is being spoken of here, as I understand it, is that this is speaking of the daily provision of mercy that we need. It is the receiving of mercy or the experiencing of the compassion of God for the daily struggles that you and I still have as we are in this world, this world of darkness. And as we experience all the struggles the temptations, the sickness. We still commit sins. And so we call out to God, God, have mercy. God, let me feel your love. God, let me feel your compassion. We say, and the Word of God says, we cast all of our burdens or our cares upon the Lord for He cares for us. Because God is faithful, as His Word tells us, His mercies fail not. But great is Thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. When we come before the throne of grace, we come before God, a God who loves us and desires now to show His compassion for us. And I believe this mercy we obtain from God the Father is, is due to this intercessory ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who knows better what we need than the one who walked this earth and was subject to everything that we were, that we are subject to. So this privilege invitation to come to the throne of grace is so that we may obtain mercy, that we may experience the compassion of God. And then secondly, it is so that we may find grace to help in our time of need. Now I think in some ways they're, they're, these are similar thoughts here, but I do believe there is a difference Here, the writer to the Hebrews seems to put the emphasis on receiving the help of God. Not just experiencing God's love. Not just sensing His compassion. But actually experiencing th something that He does for us. What we are going through right now with this pandemic is difficult. There is much fear Surrounding everything. And so we need the compassion of God. We need to, to, for God to show us mercy. But we also need His help. I think many, I know many of you, perhaps all of you in here in some way have had such times of need when some great trial has come into your life and you just didn't know what to do. And there may be someone right now in this sanctuary going through such trouble. There may be someone who's watching us who is going through some great trial. You know, they're called fiery trials for a reason, aren't they? And friends, we not only need to feel the compassion of God, His mercy, but we also need His help. And He helps us. I would say it's out of mercy that He gives us such grace as we need. We are reminded of the hymn, right? Trials dark on every hand. And we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. 
but he'll guide us with his eye and we'll follow till we die. I, I think those words of that hymn express this thought of grace that is given to us to help us in our time of need when dealing with the thorn in the flesh. The Apostle Paul, you might remember, asked that it would be taken away from him. But what did God say? No, I'm not going to take... Well, he didn't say, I'm not going to take the thorn away. He just said, my grace is going to be sufficient for you. The will of God may be that he doesn't take us out of whatever fiery trial we are in. But the blessed assurance that we have is that he will be with us that he will help us as we go through whatever trial it is that we must. So I'll say again, what a blessed privilege we have here in this invitation to come before the throne of God, to come boldly, to come with confidence so that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Let me say now a couple of things as we close. First, I would say to this, hold, hold fast Hold fast to the profession. Hold fast to the gospel message which makes our access to the throne of grace possible. And second, come. Come. He bids you. He bids you to come. He bids you to come to his throne of grace so that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. Will you come? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so humbled right now by the thought that you would desire for us to, to come into your presence as we confess that we are sinners before you. We rejoice now in this blessed invitation only because of our being in union with Jesus Christ. Because that's why we can come to find mercy or to obtain mercy and, and, to, find, and to find grace to help. It is all because of what Jesus has done in taking our sins upon him, receiving the wrath that we so deservedly should have received. And now, because he is making intercession for us right now, we can come into your most holy presence. We praise you, O oh God, for such a blessing as this. Let these words, I pray, be engraved upon our hearts and our minds as we live in these very troubling days. Lord, may one who may be looking in, may be in this congregation this morning or may be looking in through Facebook or through YouTube, Lord, who is struggling right now. May they find these words that you give to us to come, come and obtain mercy, come and find grace. May these words, Lord, be that which nourish a parched soul. Be glorified, Lord, in all of this, we pray. In Jesus' name and amen.